Hilary Couchman, Dr. Hilary Couchman. How long have you been swearing? Well, curse words or vulgarities go back really as far as language itself, but when it comes to written English, we find profanities cropping up from the 13th century. So, something like this, should I wear gloves to handle this? The protocol is that the curator handles the material. Oh, okay, right. Um, I'm pretty sure I've seen Dr. David Starkey handling stuff like this on TV. And I've even seen them let Tony Robinson have a fiddle. The protocol is the curator handles the material. Well, you said that. Do they ever let you guys go to an area just to relax? Because they, they should do. Maybe that should be part of the protocol. Swearing, swear words. One of the more prominent words is the word f But c too is also common across the Germanic and Scandinavian languages. Yeah. We also find uses of p c c well, well, what, what, where, where, what areas would these profanities emanate from? I'm thinking Manchester, Liverpool. No, from across the whole country. OK. Now, what we have here are parish records from Drayton in Shropshire. Uh, when would that be? 1295. That's what these trousers cost. So, what these documents show is how the earliest instances of swear words were typically found in the names of places or people. Mm -hmm. So, surnames often describe what someone was or did. Right. Here we have a listing for um, Henry f**k a beggar. Goodness me. Now, back then, the word f**k didn't have its current meaning. Okay. It actually referred to hitting or striking. Right, good. Uh, well, hence the phrase, let's hire some Albanians to f**k him up. So there are terms that have fallen out of use. So here in 1740, uh, we have the term rantalian, oh, which means one word. whose scrotum is so relaxed as to be longer than his penis. One wonders whether that's due to a truncated member or a distended testes. Well, I guess it's just chicken and egg. Um, we also find some fairly vulgar slang words for penis, such as beard splitter uh -huh. and arse opener. Whilst fellatio was known as bagpiping. Oh, makes sense. In the 1785 book, The Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue, uh -huh. we find the term to huffle. Would you like to have a guess at what that means? Oh, gosh, I'll have a bash. Um... Uh, to huffle um, the act of putting my head between a lady's breasts and uh, huffling. Uh, that's, you get the picture. No, it's, it's another word to fillet. <laughs> right, OK. I always find it amusing uh, when I ask people that question, what answer I'll get. <laughs> right, well, that's an interesting part of the protocol. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Hilary Mantel. Couchman. Well, one who likes to squat over. Another... It's my surname. Right, yes, of course. Why are clean hands important? Because humans are the most effective incubators of bacteria outside of imported meat. A fact first discovered 150 years ago in Soho, when its filthy reputation was based not on pole dancers from Lapland or lap dancers from Poland, Poland, but because of an outbreak of cholera. Imagine going into a newsagent and ordering not a can of Coca-Cola, but a can of coca cholera. That's effectively what the Soho residents were doing in 1854 when they came to draw water from this pump to sate, slake, or quench their thirst. That was before the physician John Snow discovered that the disease was spread through contaminated water. And this paved the way for the invention of antibiotics, a remedy against bacteria that initially seemed infallible. I said initially, slightly louder, because whilst antibiotics once stopped bacteria like these from breeding like randy Catholic rabbits, their prophylactic power has become dulled through overuse. Many liken antibiotics to giving a box of chocolates to an angry spouse. The first time the chocolates will overwhelm the wife and quell her ire completely. The sixth, seventh time, the chocolates still subdue the miffed woman, but less than they had earlier. And by the twentieth time, the chocolates have little to no potency and can even inflame the problem further. I was troubled by this. I knew more than ever before that we needed to wash our hands. But were we doing? To find out for myself, I've come to the gents' toilets at the BBC to conduct a study of my own. Hello, Alan Partridge, BBC. Uh, did you wash your hands? Yep. 
Good man. I've concentrated exclusively on the gents lose, uh, a man standing outside a women's lavatory can be seen as predatory. Equally, a man loitering outside a gentleman's toilet uh, can be fraught with ambiguity. So, uh, to put it on a more formal footing, I've got this woman with a clipboard. Uh, sorry, what's your name? Thera. Sarah. Thera. Sarah. Thera. Okay. The BBC employs some 20,000 people. Just write that down. And not all of them are going to wash their hands. Right, it is Thera. I thought, I thought you had a list. <laughs> no, it's Arabic. Okay. Menial workers, for example, are employed to pick up bits of dirt, and the likelihood of them ever being asked to shake hands with senior management are very low. Put them down as a no. Still, the results made for grim reading, with just 28% saying they washed their hands. Yeah, I'm going to wash my own hands later. <coughs> Swindon. And I've come to the British School of Hygiene to ask Professor Jean Chowdhury how clean hands can stop the spread of germs. Hygiene. Hi. Hi. Jean, hand washing. How often should we be washing them? Well, any time we come into contact with bacteria. So, um, after going to the toilet. Agreed. Uh, after handling raw meat. Right, and that's separate, isn't it? That's not a euphemism for the first one. No. Uh, raw meat can harbour some pretty nasty bacteria. So, if in doubt, wash. And the advice from the World Health Organization is that we should be washing our hands for a full 20 seconds. 15 is fine. Which is why there's actually an instructional video which shows exactly how to wash your hands. Mm. Yes, please. So we begin by rubbing the palms together, work up a nice creamy lather. Those are very creamy hands. And then you rub the back of your left hand with the right palm with interlaced fingers. Yeah. And same with the other hand. Yeah. And rinse with warm water. Yeah. Um, that's, those taps are the same as the ones over there. Oh, yeah, we shot it here. Well, so those are uh, your hands. Mm -hmm. To help us look at the discipline of yesteryear, we sent Alan back to his old school. I must warn you that uh, this film contains teachers some viewers may find disturbing. This is St Jude's High School, a secondary specialising in the performing arts and media studies. But back in the 1970s, it was an actual school and I was a pupil here. Today, the corridors of St Jude's are alive with the sound of laughter and play. Back then, however, the school echoed with an altogether different noise. The noise of corporal punishment. Thrashings were the order of the day back then. The only way is to avoid a walloping, keep out of trouble, or get homeschooled like Dominic Bentham. Although I think he ended up killing himself in his 40s. Alas, for those of us schooled in the classroom, the finger of blame didn't always land on the guilty. Partridge, what is that? Bring it here. Stop gawping for crying out loud. Ordinarily, I'd see a boy taking the long walk to the teacher's desk and think, he was being disruptive. Go on, sir, batter him. But on this occasion, that boy was me. What is it? It's a picture of you, sir, with a penis where your nose should be. Is that what you think I look like? It wasn't me, sir. It was Smithy. He's from a broken home. <laughs> Something changed in me that day. I had walked to school a boy. Now sit down, you lemon. But I returned home. A big boy. Fortunately, what the psychotic teachers of the 1970s <laughs> lacked in self-control, they also lacked in technique. Inexperienced teachers would often opt for a one-handed stroke with little backlift and a short follow-through. But swing analysis from my squash coach reveals this to be both ineffective and inaccurate. With little rotation of the hips, the backswing ends here, which means the maximum arc of the swing is shortened, and an unsteady stance means energy dissipates as the swing is completed. But watch what happens with a firmer base and a longer back lift. In this case, the swing stops here. Look at the line from the shoulder all the way down to the knee. The wider stance creates stability so that energy can be transferred from the standing leg all the way to the front knee. 
but with the hips rotated right round, the striker is like a coiled spring. If we play on, watch now how all of that force is driven down through the arc of the swing, picking up speed, picking up speed, as the front knee bears all the weight, and then POW! The striker hits through the target, continuing to rotate the hips until he ends up in a finishing pose that is the mirror image of the back lift. Impressive. Eventually, corporal punishment was subject to a blanket ban, except in emergencies. But the memories remain. Sore heads, swollen knuckles, rosy red bum cheeks. Sounds funny. Don't feel funny. So, drama therapy. It's therapy that uses role play to help people work through difficult or challenging situations. Well, like therapy, good drama encourages us to look inside. Mm. It helps us to understand our own behaviour and deal with emotional issues. In fact, Simon was telling me earlier that Aristotle coined the term catharsis to describe the healing we experience through drama. Hubris, nemesis, catharsis. Well, it's all Greek to me. Thought I'd do the joke this time, seeing as uh, Simon was being a bit serious. But what kind of problems does drama therapy help to confront? It's very versatile. Marital strife, uh, workplace disagreements, psychological trauma. Drama therapy is not always easy. It can be very challenging and sometimes tearful. Mm. But it should always feel welcoming. I think you just described the pub quiz I go to. <laughs> you see, you should be saying this. <laughs> Uh, now, I believe that we're going to see some drama therapy in action. That's right, Jenny. Um, over here, we have two actors, mm -hmm. Daniel and Louise. And in a typical therapy situation, they would play out scenarios that couples can try themselves. Right. Um, now, in this scenario, Louise thinks that Daniel is emotionally closed off. But Daniel feels that as he's getting older, he does need more space. Guys? And you wonder why we never resolve anything. It's because we argue, and then five minutes later, you get upset, and I have to back down. No one's saying you have to. But that's what happens when you play that card. It's not a card, Daniel. It's how I feel. Just because you're a closed book doesn't mean I have to be. <laughs> what am I supposed to say to that? You should tell her that... Sorry, that's... No, 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 that's fine. Do you want to jump in? Oh, me? God, no. Yeah, no, please do. Step in for Daniel. No, I, it's just it, it, I've not acted for quite a while. Oh, I'm sorry. I hadn't realised you'd acted. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, just with North Norfolk players, a bit of acting, producing, directing. Most recently, uh, A Few Good Men. Oh, sorry. amazing. What part did yeah. you play? The Jack Nicholson role, so, Ooh. yeah. Yeah, bit of, a bit, bit of a tough act to follow, but uh, I just tried to do it so, you know, like... like the truth! You can't handle the truth! Yeah, so I, so I sort of went higher and then I did the scoff at the end, which I don't think Nicholson thought of, so... Well, how would you feel about having a go at this scene? Um, yeah, sure. Why not? Oh, great. OK, um, Daniel, you step out. Louise, you're in the kitchen, you're making dinner. And Alan, just start a conversation uh, when you're ready. OK. Um, um. Don't overthink it. OK, yep, right. Mmm. Smells good. It's just spag bowl. I didn't mean the dinner. Well, you never normally come in till it's cold. <sighs> I'm sorry to go on. I just don't want you to feel like I'm complaining because I want to spend time with you. Hey, baby girl. Just been out of my bike. My motorcycle's important to me. You know that. <laughs> but you know the best part of the journey? <laughs> Riding that steel horse back home to you. Try it without the accent. Me or her? You. OK, but the general direction... Don't forget all that. Both of you sit at the table. OK. Now, let's just pretend that she's your actual wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I wish I could spend more time with you. See, I hear you saying that, but I don't <sighs> feel it. Then we'll figure something out, but you're going to have to stop going on at me. I'm sorry if I've got a gift that people enjoy and I find very satisfying. I'm sorry that you don't have that because for some reason God didn't give you any talent. Shall we stop there? Yeah, that felt good. <laughs>